So we are, uh, the Simons Institute is a collaborative research institute, and we run uh, two programs every semester, typically. And each of them has about 70 uh, long-term visitors, uh, junior and senior to Berkeley, and each including a boot camp, which is the one uh, uh, we are starting to today, and uh, three workshops that bring even more visitors. And this semester, the graph limits and uh, process on networks from epidemics to misinformation is one of those programs, which is your program. So welcome to the boot camp of this program. And I want to thank the organizers, Christian Borg, Jennifer Chase, she's not here yet, Nicole, is where's Nicole? Somewhere. She's uh, disturbing us in Amin, very, who's very well behaved. And um, thank you, and is here. You know. Right. So for arranging an excellent set of speakers for this week, and in a minute, I'll, I'll actually hand over to Christian to speak about the details about the boot camp. Uh, I just want to say more generally from the perspective of a director, what are the goals of a boot camp? Is um, essentially it's an icebreaker for the program, both from a scientific point of view and a social point of view. Hopefully we'll get everyone on the same page uh, on what the spectrum of the program themes are. And uh, it will also be very good for us as an archive for the state of the art in the field uh, at this point. And uh, one year later, after this program, there'll be a reunion. And uh, many things that get started in this uh, semester are actually gonna take effect uh, and be finished uh, later, but not while you're here. Um, and in a year, when we have the reunion, it will be a chance to see what comes out of the program. And uh, Another thing that I'd like to say is uh, soon you're going to get a lot of emails from us if you haven't already to ask you to update the research report, um, uh, sort of to talk about your research. And that's going to happen mostly, I guess, at the end of the program. But throughout the program, you'll get various emails announcing social activities and things to do in the area. Um, and all this, you know, answering our emails and and um, crediting research done here to the Simons Institute is very important for us for various reasons, some obvious like fundraising and, and record keeping for theoretical computer science at large. And uh, I guess another thing to say is that we're always looking for new programs. So if anybody here during the semester comes up with an, an idea that they think will be wonderful to pursue for whole term, uh, please let me know. Uh, some logistics, as you know, we're not supposed to bring food or coffee in here. Uh, but there's plenty of food and coffee in the breaks outside. Lunches, you're on your own. Um, masks inside are not required, but strongly recommended. Um, lockers are available on the ground floor. Uh, there's Wi-Fi, you know, it's Cal Visitor or Eddie Room, if you have it from your um, institution where you're coming from. And we're using a hybrid format. So there's both streaming and in person. A, and our videographer is Omid who's sitting there in that little room and uh, meet far and uh, they will assist you if you have any problems and, and mic, put mics on you and so forth. So finally, a big thanks to Elizabeth Yun, our, uh, there she is, Elizabeth, our events coordinator for all her work on the local arrangement for this week and feel free to ask her anything that comes up. And I, again, I think I met you in the orientation, but I wanna say again that I hope you have a fantastic semester and take advantage of this very unique time and opportunity. Okay, Shafi. Thank you. I will not spend too much time to take it away from the first speaker. So uh, I just wanted to welcome all of you. Uh, I mean, Nicole, Jennifer, and I are really happy to how this has come together. We have a lot of nice speakers this week. Um, we will cover today's program with sort of representative for the whole week. We'll have one talk on graph limits and sort of more general the area, let's call it graph limits, graph modeling, random graphs, things like that. We have one talk on epidemics, which is our second large community. And then we have one talk on economics of networks. Um, and that will weave through the week in various formats. Um, will, uh, I don't know whether I should go to the program day by day, but we will have three lectures on graph limits. We have three lectures on modeling random graphs and limits of sparse graphs. We'll have four lectures on economics on graph. We have three lectures on epidemics. And then we have uh, 
a few lectures on processes on graphs, which are not epidemics or economics, well, they sort of could fit into both of them by Amin and Yegane uh, on uh, cascading processes on networks and um, well, percolation models for epidemics, things like that. And finally, Nicole will give us a talk, which I think nicely summarized how these communities actually have a lot in common without knowing it. Um, she will talk about uh, segregation models, but the interesting for us for tutorial is she will use what's called the differential equation method. And that's actually very similar to methods people use in epidemics to understand um, how actually you have large stochastic epidemics, which then behave deterministically. And for CS, it's the other way around. We try to understand some stochastic process. We come up with some artificial epidemics and then show that this has a law of large numbers, which then actually proves what we want in computer science. And Nicole's talk will be an example of that. Um, with that, I hand it to the today's uh, chair, which is Amin. So he from non on, I don't control anything anymore. So Amin will control everything. Okay. Since I'm in control, oh, let me just, um, so first of all, welcome. And um, one thing that I want to add, given that we have a multidisciplinary audience, um, the point of the bootcamp is to give, you know, sort of uh, everyone, uh, you know, sort of an understanding of the language of the, you know, sort of um, people that we have from mathematical epidemiology, from um, economics, uh, operations research, computer science, and um, the discrete mathematics and probability. Um, please um, slow down the uh, speakers. And if there's something that you don't understand, I have talked to Christian and I'm sure other speakers uh, will agree with me that um, we want to make sure that uh, we will have an interactive, uh, we will have interactive talks. So um, starting with Christian, I'm going to, you know, sort of uh, slow him down if I feel like he's going uh, too quickly and uh, also with the rest of the speakers. Um, and uh, with that, I'll give it to Christian. Okay, I think I have my own one. Um, so let's see whether this works. Um, how are we monitoring question is as a, we have online people here, are there people online? Do we know that? Are there people online? Are there? Yes. So how can they ask questions? Or they, I hear them in the ether. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'm very happy to talk about this this area, which uh, we together, well, you see with, with whom uh, we co-invented now almost 20 years ago. So let me just get into it. Okay. So really, if you these will be the three questions, and I will try to answer them at various level of depth. So I will first have one slide on each and. So when we started looking at graph limits, we were actually working on some, I think routing on the internet, or maybe it was actually web spam. So we tried to understand how the World Wide Web looks, and we were discussing with Jennifer and I were discussing with Lazi Lovas, and we were saying, look, we want to understand what's natural because then you could maybe decide what is web spam and what's not web spam. And we feel it's a huge network. So you all know probably what's a pure combinatorialist, you know what the limit of a large graph is. And we want to now understand how sort of smaller graphs go towards large graphs because then we can understand how the growing internet may be growing naturally or there is some web spammer who is sort of artificially trying to get high page rank. Um, and then Lazi said, sorry, such a theory didn't exist. And so that's how we started discussing that. And I will um, today discuss this actually for dense graphs, because it turned out it took us a long time to actually deal with dense graphs, even though obviously in the end you want to deal with sparse graphs if you talk about the internet or any networks. I mean, there are some maybe dense networks if you have small biological networks, maybe they're dense. But in many cases, the networks we have are 
sparse, right? I don't, I'm not friends with a positive fraction of the people on Facebook. And same for the web, same for routing and so on. Good. So what are the motivating questions? The questions are, you have two large graphs on different number of nodes, LinkedIn and I don't know, uh, Facebook. Okay, are they similar? Are they not similar? What does that mean? And mathematically, once you ask this question, you will very much fast be led into the question, what is the limit of a sequence of large graphs? And finally, um, a related question is, well, how do we model large graphs, which was also interesting to us, okay? And these three turn out to be very related. So let me go a little bit more into it, okay? So when should we consider two large graphs? Well, it turns out if you go a little around, you will get very fast contradictory requests from all your friends. You talk to the combinatorialists or the social scientists and they say, look, I want to know how many triangles are closed. So how many friends, if I have two friends, how many of those are friends with each other, which goes into counting triangles or counting the open triangles, sort of open arcs counting how many clicks are there of five people where actually two of them hate each other and never talk to each other. So a complete graph with one list missing and so on. Okay, and the combinatorialists are very co comfortable with that. That's extreme graph series, they count subgraphs. So these two communities get along, okay? Starting with Erdős. You have the statisticians who will say, no, 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 wait, this is sort of, nobody can count graphs, you should just, sample from a large graph and see what you see and you want to see what's the distribution of the small graphs you see. Um, your computer scientists will say all very nice, way too local, you want global properties. What's min cut, max cut, maybe you have generalizations of that. Mm -hmm. And finally, your physicist will say, no, 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 this is still not good enough. You want to put an easing model or some other statistical physics model on it. And I consider two graphs similar if actually the physics on them is similar, okay? So this is number one, okay? Now it turns out that all these notions for dense graphs at least doesn't hold true for once they get sparser, it only holds partially true. But for dense graphs, it turns out they're all equivalent. This, this one, it turns out to be actually the most easy to prove um, it's more or less an observation by the Iconis and Janssen. There's much more in that paper, but this equivalence of the first one came from the Iconis and Janssen a year after we started that. And we actually were not really aware of that part when we developed the theory. Um, so, because at Microsoft, there were machine learners, but no statisticians, I'm just joking. Anyhow, so what is, uh, what is the right limit is then the next question. And now if you have these notions, you may say, well, it's very simple. It's some vector in some infinite dimensional space. It's a collection of subgraphs, a subgraph counts. It's a collection of distributions. It's a collection of various cuts or it's a collection of ground state energies, which is not very satisfying. And so it turns out here comes the first term graphon. So let's pause a moment. What is a graphon? So in this simple setting, a graphon just consists of a function on the unit square into zero one. Okay. So think of it as the generalization of a graph, right? Instead of a graph which has a vertex set, you now have a set of real numbers, and the adjacency matrix would be vertex set times vertex set. Here, the analog will be real numbers times real numbers, and it goes into zero one, so it would be weighted adjacency matrix. So it's a continuum analog of a graph and is a relative natural limit object. Um, and uh, that was sort of uh, first realized by Lovas and Zegetti, and then for one of these quantities, and then in a long paper. So BCLSV will always be Box, Chase, Lovas, Shows, Westergombe, uh, which was sort of the original group as it started. I really still very fondly remember working with Vera Shows. She's this grand dame of Hungarian mathematics. If you have ever met her, she suggests you can't but like her. 
Okay, so finally, how would we want to model large graphs? Well, Erdős Rennie is a common journalist, GNP, everybody probably knows. I will recall what it is. Um, uh, slide generalization are stochastic block models used a lot in social science where you have different groups which connect with different probabilities. And the question is, what is the right generalization? And again, let me just give the answer right in the beginning. So there's a theorem by Aldous Hoover, which I will walk you through, which says that essentially all natural dense random graph models can be generated by a graphite. Okay. Now Aldous Hoover, the name Graphon, I think we invented with Lazi. I still remember a conference room at Microsoft in 2008 or 2009 where we came up with the word. So Aldous and Hoover certainly didn't know the word Graphon. They didn't even know the, the theory of graph limit was totally not discussed. So this connection to the theory of graph limit was not known, but actually the theorem was already around not be known to us when we developed this theory. And so now I will formulate that a little bit more general. So a graph one is still a function of two variables, okay? It's symmetric. So if you exchange the two variables, it's the same. And it lives on some probability space, which you should think as a space of features. And then if you have a space of features, you can say, everybody in your potential social networks has some features. And if Amin and I have certain features, we have a height, I'm originally German, he's Iranian. So there are some discrete features. We have some intelligence, we have some taste. And now as a function of these two features, it's more or less likely that we connect. And that is what these models do. So they also seem quite natural if you formulate them. But really, Aldous Hoover says that this all there is if you ask some very natural conditions. So to summarize sort of what we will do, we will have large graphs with the vertex set and JC matrix. We'll have graph fonts, which consist of some probability space, which is your feature space and a symmetric measure function. And graph limits, it turns out, lead from here to here and non-parametric random graph models lead back. So I think, I so if you remember nothing, this is sort of what you should remember. There are all these different notions of graph being similar that turn out to be equivalent. Um, once you have sort of similarity, you discuss what a limit is. The limit can be expressed in terms of a graph on and if you have a graph and you can use it to generate large random graphs. So far is other questions, is it roughly clear? I mean, am I too fast, am I too slow? So far, so it's too long, right? Okay, good. Um, now, so how would we model large graphs? So probably most of you know what GNP is, but let me just recall it. So it's a simple Bohr's graph you could imagine. You have n vertices, and then you have n choose two possible edges, and iid, each of them you choose with probability p, okay? So they're zeros and ones, but it's sort of stochastically extremely homogeneous. And because it's so homogeneous, it's not really used much, but what is used a lot actually is the stochastic block model. So here you just postulate you have um, K groups. Okay, so you have in this room, I don't know, since I was describing I mean and me that way, say you have groups of different nationalities and now the Iranians and the Germans happen to sort of like each other a lot, which has a history at Microsoft and then that of other nations may, may not like each other that much. And you have sort of Iranians, Iraqis may not be that likely to be connected and or Indians and Persians, Indians and Pakistani. So it sort of depends. And then again, the exceptions, right? But when you do it stochastically, you come up with this matrix of probabilities that your different groups will be friends. And now you have these groups of people, which in the simplest case, we just say are chosen at random. Um, and then you just connect people which belong to community X and Y with probability B, X, Y, where B is this matrix. 
Okay. That model is used all over. Okay. If people want to understand, I mean, in the background at LinkedIn, when people try to model things, they model it like that. Okay. Um, so it has so its problem if you have to have sort of 10,000 different groups, it starts to be questionable whether you're over parameterizing and whether maybe what's called a non parametric model might be better, which is the so called inhomogeneous random graph. So you have this graph on, okay, so some symmetric function over your feature space. Then you have again a vertex at n. And now rather than a group membership, you choose a feature in your feature space. And so the random term and Iranian, my random height, my random interest in sport versus classical music. And then for all i smaller than j, you connect i to j independently with this probability. If i is connected to j, j is connected to i, so that's why I'm writing this. And in our simple setting, graphs have no loops. I'm not sort of friends with myself um, or everybody's friends with myself, in, in which case we don't need to put it. So anyhow, graphs are graphs without loops. So the way you've written the stochastic block model, there have to be as many Iranians as Germans. Okay, so this is a simplification for this tutorial. In general, you could, instead of the uniform distribution, you can choose some distribution, um, which is in this model automatically because I have put a mu. Okay, so you're totally right. You will not in general want the uniform distribution. You could always subdivide your groups to make them roughly equal, but I just didn't want to have stochastic block rule of n, p, and another vector of probabilities and all. Everything gets more complicated in notation. You don't learn anything new, at least mathematically, if there are more Iranians than Germans. So, um, so how would we, right? So now the question is how general is it? Okay, is that natural or not? And so now I'm going to way step back, okay? So I look as a following, I look just at a very simple setting. I have a sequence of random values, okay? You could think of some medical data or we just observe in the real world some sequence of, of random variables in this simple case there in zero one. And we call them exchangeable if you think of this, for example, as discrete time. If time doesn't really matter, if you could reorder time and get the same distribution. So we have this sequence of random variables such that the distribution of any subset of n is the same if I permute the labels, okay? So the distribution of x1, x2, x3 is the same as that one of x3, x2, x1, okay? And oh, now my phone is speaking, well, we'll eventually, okay, so, so let me give you an example because that may sound very weird to you, okay? So let's do something which is called the Polyaran, which some, who has heard of the Polyaran? Okay, so the Polyaran is a very nice probabilistic model, which is used to model a lot of things actually in computer science. Um, and it's a very simple model. Okay, so you have this urn and in the urn there are balls, okay? You shake the urn, you grab into the urn, you pull out a ball. In this example it happens to be red. And if it's red, you grab another red ball and throw it back into the urn. And if it's green, you throw it green. And then you repeat, okay? So you have this, you start with R and G, red and green balls, and you do this process, okay? And now, Let's look at that a little bit, okay? So what is the probability of seeing the sequence R, 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 G, G? Well, the first time you have R plus G balls in your bin, the probability that it's red is R. Now, after that, you have R plus one red ones in, so you have this number of balls, and this is the probability of seeing red. Now you have one red more, so you have this probability, divided by the next normalization. And now you sort of the probability of getting a green one, there's still just G green ones in it. So it's G over the normalization and next times G plus one, okay? 
So what happens if we want to, if we look at the probability of getting a different order, okay? Well, the first one is the same, red over red plus green. And you might sort of, here you might think, look, if I have done RRR, now I'm sort of much more likely to see reds because I have more reds in there, right? So maybe this sort of would have a tendency to actually eventually be sort of concentrated more. And maybe this is sort of looks more mixed. So maybe it has a different probability, but actually it doesn't. It has exactly the same. Okay, and why is that? Well, when you draw your first red ball, you have red over your norm. So first of all, the normalization just goes up by one each step. Okay, no matter what you find. Now, when you do the first red, you get R. When you do the second red, you get R plus one. When you do the third red, you get R plus two. It doesn't matter where the position of these guys is. So you always get this expression, okay? For the polar urn, you can calculate everything exactly that we won't do here, um, which I did in my graduate class. But there is a very nice theorem which tells you what happens to this sequence. And the theorem says, essentially, this behaves as if you were drawing independent coins. Now, it's not really independent coins. You see, this is not just always the same probability. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a theorem by a guy called Definetti. It's quite old and it holds in a much more general setting that can sit in, in any nice probability space, okay? Um, so assume you have an exchangeable sequence, means that it's invariant under, if you take a finer subsequence, you reshuffle it, has the same probability. So then it says the following, there exists some probability distribution on zero one, such that you can actually obtain your sequence by first doing the following. You can first draw a probability P from this distribution, okay? So this is a continuous distribution, which gives you this value P. And then uh, after having chosen that, you just can choose this IID uniformly at random at this probability P. And if you calculate that for the Puglia urn, you can actually do that explicitly. You will find that this distribution is just the better distribution. If you don't know what the better distribution is, don't worry, you can just calculate it and I can write down what the better distribution is, okay? We know much more, which I sort of just mentioned, namely that actually, if you look at your sequence, if you condition on the empirical averages conversion to something, that something will be obviously P. And conditioned on that, you get this independence again. So another way of formulating this theorem would be saying, given exchangeable sequence, it's the same thing as an independent sequence. Once you condition on this event in the sigma algebra at infinity, which is this convergent empirical average, okay? So this is a super nice theorem. It holds very general. In general, just this will be here, sort of, it was on zero one. In general, it will be if you have discrete random variables with k values, it will be distribution over the simplex. In general, it will be a probability distribution on probability distributions, and you can make sense of it if your space is nice. What does it mean for the random variables to be obtained by a process? Like, I mean, are you saying there's some sort of convergence between if I do the polyurn thing and this coin flipping thing, or? So what I'm saying is if you imagine doing this polya urn thing forever, okay, you might want to calculate six, right? Because you may want to calculate, well, what is eventually the average of, of red and green or something like that, right? So what I'm saying just sort of as an algorithm, you could either do your polya urn thing, run it forever, or you could do a different algorithm. You could draw, you flip it, you find a P according to this better distribution. Then you choose the P, and now you choose your sequence independently. So to some extent, if you had seen the whole sequence, then effectively you sort of for this polar urn will have decided what eventually the strengths of red and green is. And once it's decided what the strengths of red and green is, eventually 
you actually can now just act as if a thing depends. And that is used a lot when people analyze things like preferential attachment or things like that, where it's more complicated than that, but where you, there would be no way you could calculate anything in these models if it were not for this beautiful theory. There was a question there. Just yeah. to, to clarify, you're saying that the whole sequence that you would get from doing a FOIA earn experiment is the same distribution as the whole sequence that you'd get doing this IID stuff? Yes. Thanks. Right, so I'm saying do the polyar earn step by step forever. You get an infinite sequence. You have a probability distribution on infinite sequences. So there's some probability of seeing a particular sequence. Right. If it was a six, a, okay. Let's not worry about the mass. There's some probability of seeing a particular sequence. <laughs> and if you instead, if you want to calculate that probability, you could instead just do this beta distribution, which is, okay, let me just describe to you in words. It's just choosing uniform random variables. I think R plus G plus one, which you put in your unit interval. And then you look where you have the first R and where is the rest G. And the beta distribution is the position of this point in the middle. Um, which is another way of thinking it at, of predefining a strength of red versus green. Um, and so, so you have this setting. Okay. Uh, you're yes. saying that for each, for an arbitrary sequence of an arbitrary lens, the probability of this being generated by the Poirier on is equal to the probability that the sequence generated by that algorithm. Yes. Okay. So, in the end, it's a CM on finite sequences, right? So you take an arbitrary <laughs> length for your own sequence, five. Okay, so back to this example. So instead of calculating this, you could have done something different. You could have looked at the beta distribution, drawn a P at random, and then done five independent coin flips where you probability P, you choose red, with probability one minus P, you choose green. Obviously, for five of them, this is simpler than coming up with this beta distribution. But once I send five to very large, this beta distribution is a much easier way. And it's sort of morally you sort of, essentially you sort of, but in this process, as you put green, green and red, the strengths of red will vary, right? But eventually it will settle to a certain ratio of red and green, which is not equal to the original one. It will settle to something. But once this something has settled, this is sort of this P. And then you put sort of, but it turns out that actually the finite things are just exactly the same. The ratio converges to some constant. To some probability, to some constant, which is a random variable. I see. Okay, and the distribution of this random variable is in this case given by a better distribution. Yes? You have another question, yeah? Do this, does this theorem tell us how to find this probability P or is this an existence proof? This is just an existence proof. So for the polar earth, but in many cases, actually we can then calculate it. So you're right, it, to be really useful, it would be nice to know what this probability P is. If the only thing I know is that, I actually don't know. So if you have some medical experiment or something like that, you will have to actually empirically find out what this probability P is. And then, but for that reason, a lot of processes, de facto people say, okay, it's probably exchangeable. So if I condition on this sequence running forever, which is probably doesn't, um, then there must be this probability distribution. So now I can just act as if I were dealing with independent events and I can do my sort of all my statistics for the medical events I want to do, acting as if it were independent, even though it's not really independent. Okay. So in practice, you can either you're sort of like in the polar urn and you have to be clever to find the distribution in the end, or you have to empirically sort of find this P. And then maybe if you would you run your experiment again, you would get a different P because it's a random distribution on this P. Sorry. Yes. Function, uh, so the general case. What is the no, so. You want the general case? 
Okay, so I have x1 up to xn living in some Polish space. You want to know this kind of stuff? I want to know the notion of B. Of what? Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. That's a Bernoulli. Oh, you know what to know about a Bernoulli is. Okay, Bernoulli is a coin flip with sorry, sorry. Okay, this question you should immediately, if the notation is not clear, clear, just shout and don't raise your hand, just interrupt. Okay. BP is Bernoulli P, which is just a fancy notion for a coin flip. So it's a coin flip with probability P. Okay, so this just said x1 up to xn, each of them can independently be chosen to be one with probability p and zero with probability one, one minus p. And that is this fancy notion. Any other notation I didn't explain? Okay, good. So now we come sort of to the idols. And for that, you have a notion of, so we had so far exchangeable sequences. Now we have exchangeable random graphs. So in words, an exchangeable random graph is some infinite graph such that if you look at any finite subset of vertices and you exchange the labels of these vertices, okay, so instead of naming the first three vertices, Amin, Nicole, and Christian, you name them Christian, Nicole, and Amin. And then the distribution of your whole infinite graph should be the same if you change the labels. Okay, so this means you will have graphs, which maybe the graph itself is not invariant under relabeling. In that case, it would be because we're all friends, but maybe we happen sort of, maybe Amin and Nicole are stronger friends because Nicole is a really good Persian cook and Amin likes it. So, so it's not really symmetric, but if you sort of exchange the labels, if you look at it, an unlabeled graph, it, the distribution should be independent, okay? So in another realization, Amin would get a different feature, Nicole would get a different feature, I would get a different feature, and in distribution, the relationship between the three of us should not depend on our labels. Okay, so if she's, so, that is called exchangeable, okay? And now I can give you a formal definition if you're a mathematician, okay? So if you have an infinite random graph, it has an infinite adjacency matrix. So it's a matrix of zero and ones where you have a one if there's an edge and a zero if there isn't, okay? So that is your random array. And it's called exchangeable if for all N, the distribution of your array where you relabel the first n vertices in some way is the same as original distribution. I don't say that for each realization of your graph, this is the same as this. I say they have the same probability. Okay. Um, and if you're really a mathematician, you will sort of say, well, you could use different labels here and here doesn't make much sense for a graph because a vertex has one label, but so there are different notions of exchange that are jointly and separately exchangeable, but forget about that. My definition here is this one and this is the one we're using. Okay, so now is the question, what is the analog of the infinity? Okay. And now, since I gave you a random graph, you might say, oh, it's very simple. It will be just, you have some distribution on P and then you draw G and P and you're done, okay? And you might suspect that if you have this exchangeability among all vertices, this thing should look pretty homogeneous, but actually that's not the case. And so, so but me, okay, so here comes the theorem. Okay, so Aldous Hoover says, if we have this exchange array, okay, or formulate differently, we have this infinite random graph, which is invariant under relabeling. I put the diagonal equals zero because we don't have self loops. Okay, then the theorem says the following. There exists a function of three variables. So he had it in this form, okay? He didn't have the word graph on, he didn't even know that something like that exists. There's a function of three variables, 
W alpha X and Y from zero one to the power three into zero one, such that we can generate this array by doing the following. First, you choose some alpha. So uniformly at random, so alpha is pi over five. Okay. And now, depending on that alpha, now you have a function of two variables. And now you use this function of two variables the way we did before. So you choose x1 up to x2 and so on an infinite sequence uniformly at random in zero one. And then you choose the entries of your matrix adjust independently with probability P equals W alpha of this X, Y should be up of X, I and X, J. With that probability, you put an edge. So this probability is different for every edge because typically this W of X, I, X, J is different for every edge, but it has sort of this global invariance by the fact that, well, if I, if I choose these in a different order, right, they have the same distribution. And from that, this graph will inherit this relabeling invariance. And the theorem said, this is the only way you can get that. Okay? In modern theory, in modern phrasing, which is not theirs, um, which Diakonis uh, and Janssen pointed out, this can be rephrased as, if GN is a finite subgraph of an exchangeable infinite random graph, then the distribution can just be generated by a random graph on W, right? And the randomness is mediated through this alpha. Do you mean an induced subgraph there? Hmm? Do you mean induced finite subgraph or just any old finite subgraph? I mean induced finite subgraph. Yes, should be induced. What's the difference between the two? So an induced, so a subgraph is if I have a as a large graph. So this graph has. This graph as a subgraph here. Okay, so this is you choose a subset of verges, this is a subset of edges, this is a subgraph. An induced subgraph means once you commit on the vertices, you must have all the edges in. So the, this is not an induced subgraph here, it happens to be an induced subgraph here. But um, if I had a sort of different large graph, there are no solid. I take an infinite triangle lattice. Okay, it has no induced subgraph, which is an open triangle, but it does have many subgraphs which are open triangles. Okay, so and and he's right. Gn should actually be uh, the graph you see when you just look on the n vertices, which means it's an induced. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one being, why did you choose x and y from a zero from the interval zero one instead of integers? So I could think of a different formulation in which x and y were written, you know, were chosen from numbers from one to one. And so would it still make sense? It would still make sense if you so Alison Hoover just formulated it like that. Okay. Now um we formulated graphons differently. We said there should be some feature space, and x and y should be from that feature space. And you can choose, um, so your feature space has to be rich enough. So for example, you can't say the feature space is just the color red green. Okay. But you could choose the feature space to be the natural numbers if you put the right probability measure. Because I mean, it's sort of right. I can real numbers, I can write down as a sequence of zero and ones, and then you can sort of map that in some way. So you can find some discrete space which would be essentially isomorphic to the interval zero one. And, um, and the other way around, for example, if this W will only depend on 
if I had a W which would just look like this, here's your one, which looks like that, and there's some values here. Okay, maybe one half from the diagonal, and here one third, tenths. Okay, then you see that W only depends on whether I align the first interval or the second. And therefore, this would be equivalent to just choosing your feature space to be the numbers red and green and give probability one half to red, red, and green, green, and giving probability one third to red, green. I mean, or the other way. Uh, one, one ten, I should do this differently. So maybe I should ask my question differently. You have uncomfortable. Uncountably many points in this set. Is that important? Because you're taking, you know, finite samples or for G infinity, you know, sort of, it's a still. That is important because otherwise it's not general. Okay. So, um, but as I said, uncountable is really not the point if it's sort of, it's really infinite because as we, I mean, they are sort of, you can approximate this by countably many and they are sort of, um, to be the most general, your, your probability space has to be what's called atomos. Okay. Um, so you should be in some way for each for each vertex, there should be one sort of nearby. It shouldn't have just sort of delta functions sitting around. Um, because then you would start to be too special. Okay, so it turns out that. So behind that is some theory of probability spaces, which says that actually the most general probability space you could think of is essentially the interval zero one with the uniform distribution. So that's a theorem. Mass. So you can think of two probability spaces of being isomorphic. You have some map how you map one to the other. And it turns out that you give me any probability space and I can find isomorphism which maps it onto the interval zero one with the uniform distribution. Question? Yes. But I think to be clear here, we cannot just substitute the natural numbers for zero one. That is not the natural numbers are not good enough. Otherwise it's not it's not the cool thing. You need uncountable. Oh yeah. yes, otherwise yeah. you can't match. So otherwise you will not have it to be atom free. Right? Yeah. I mean you said free. something about sequences, but then you need n to the power of n or something. Yes. So, I mean, if you put the natural numbers, put some probability distribution on, you get a special case, but you can't write any probability space just like that. Okay. And somehow, any probability space, if you look at it, will give you something exchangeable. So, for the theorem to sort of be true, you need this kind of generator. If you want to approximate it, you can sort of approximate it by any finite number. So, um, can you help me understand the delta between 1a and 1b? That's 1a and 1b. The and... Oh, so, so the delta is sort of, so definite is just a one dimensional sequence. Which is invariant if you relabel. So I could interpret a two dimensional sequence as a one dimensional sequence, but then it's not invariant the way the finite. The way we did that, it's not. So, so that is true. You could write this as um, you see here, I have a particular way of doing that, right? I don't have the map pi, which, so if you, if you had a permutation of the edges, Pi of ij is sort of, and then it's invariant. Then you could see it as a one dimensional sequence because it can map n to n squared. Um, and then you would actually not get the theorem. Okay, so Aldous Huber really needs that you have sort of either the same permutation here or one here and another one here, then you get a different version of Aldous Huber. But you can't have a permutation of the edges that would actually give you a different thing. Okay, so in general, they're sort of our expert sits in the back. You can have sort of this 
pretty arbitrary probability spaces. You have some symmetry operation on them. And if you have the symmetry operation on it, that will give you a representation theorem which says that your sequence can be generated by choosing sort of some random variable and then doing something else. And it sort of sometimes, and, and sometimes if the symmetry group is small, it's not very useful. If it's large, you get something as simple as in the definitely for sequences or in Aldous Hoover for random arrays. Um, and there are many other versions of sort of this kind of theory. It's, it's a whole subfield, and we have the expert in the audience. Yes. Previous slides. Uh, how many next slides? Sorry. The further next. Slide. Next slide. Sorry. Next slide is this here. Yeah, yeah, I, this one. Yeah. Uh, so it seems to me that even though the after sampling alpha, after alpha is fixed, all edges are IID. No, after alpha is fixed and the feature of all vertices. Oh, sorry, not, not identical, but independent. And, but only once you condition on the features. So first you choose a random W, which is choosing alpha. Once you have this W, then for each vertex, you choose a feature. And once you have fixed the features, then the edges are independent. I see. Uh, okay. For the alpha, the, like the function W of alpha X and Y can depend arbitrarily strange on alpha. Yes. Uh, is it possible to actually find such a function? So this is again a question of representatives, okay? So you can think of this as very, um, so I actually like to think about it really in the sense of a random graph, on, which is just a way to formulate that. But you again, okay, so you have a function of two variables, now you have a probability distribution on functions of two variables, which actually can be characterized by a function of three variables. So in principle, you could write down the function in some cases, right? But in practice, um, in practice, there are two things. Um, one is that we often actually don't need the alpha. So it turns out I don't think I have that here. Did I put it here? No, I didn't. Um, so it turns out that if your graph is such that if you have that the subgraphs on the induced subgraphs on, di on disjoint vertex sets are independent, which we actually have in many cases, then the theorem says there exists a W and not a random W. Um, okay, so then you don't need this third coordinate. Um, but W can still be quite complicated, okay, because it's an arbitrary function of two variables. Um, in practice, you might, and actually, if you put here the interval zero or one, um, that you sort of need, to, even though you might, for instance, say, wait a sec, my features should be, it should be Gaussian vector in 10 dimensions or something like that. I mean, you do machine learning, so have some probability distribution, let's just say it's a Gaussian. Okay. And so it's a Gaussian in 10 dimensions. And then you say, and in addition, this function should probably be smooth. Maybe it's a scalar product of your two features or the distance of the features in something. So when you do this, when you would model this in machine learning, would never allow this complicated a function, okay? But you would want to allow a more than one dimensional space. And now if you take your five dimensional space um, and you want to map it back to the interval zero, one, and makes the two spaces isomorphic, you can imagine that maps which, which have sort of a nice continuous function in R5, and now you map them onto a function on zero one, that function will not be continuous anymore, okay? 
So to some extent, if you really insist on the interval zero one, you have to allow very general functions. In practice, if you allow yourself more reasonable feature spaces, you can assume that these functions are maybe actually essentially linear. Okay, so it, it turns out that, okay, that has to do with something called the spectral theorem. You can expand any function into sort of eigenvectors and which is the same as W being finite ranks in your approximation and being the same as being finite rank after some other mappings just means that your function will be a scalar product of two of these guys. So to some extent, you can in many cases approximate W by just saying you have some probability distribution on R, Rn or Rk and you take the scalar product of the two and then you sort of have maybe sort of you stretch some coordinates in one direction and the other. So in practice, these functions are not as complicated as people never would use these complicated functions. They would say, I have my network. I want to non-parametrically learn that. I have some idea what the dimension of the feature space is. And now I make my standard analogs of better functions or something for, for higher dimensions as my space of the graph on. So in practice, people would not and nobody would do this very general setting and nobody would do the interval zero one. But if you insist on the interval zero one, you better allow pretty complicated functions here. Okay, so let me summarize the first part. A graph one is a symmetric two variable function over a probability space. We can think of the elements of this as features you map a pair of features into a number between zero and one. And then once you have such a function, you can generate the so-called inhomogeneous random graph by choosing first your features in your feature space according to your probability distribution, one per vertex independently. And then just independently, as you pointed out, connect vertex i with vertex j with probability w of x i x j. Seems pretty natural, right? So you and I are connected with some probability which depends on his and my feature. Um, and by Aldous Hoover, if you have an exchangeable family of random graphs, technically speaking, you need that you actually have an infinite graph is exchangeable and then these are the finite induced subgraphs. Then you can always find some W, possibly random, which describes this. So this is how much I will say about model. So I guess you would just to have very basic questions. Um, exchangeable is kind of like uh, isomorphic. If, a, if everything was deterministic, two graphs are exchangeable if they're isomorphic. Well, half is isomorphic is exchangeable if actually if any permutation is an isomorphism. So that really makes the graph <laughs> very uninteresting. Very uninteresting. Okay. Complete graph, empty graph, I can't uh, there may be some others. But <laughs> Right, open triangle is already not exchangeable. If, it, if you saw so deterministic graphs are typically not exchangeable because it would really mean invariant under all the labels. And then in random. Just like same thing, okay, which deterministic sequence is exchangeable? <laughs> the sequence 0, 0, 0, 0, and the sequence 1, 1, 1, and that's it. Okay, and which deterministic graphs are exchangeable? Well, I think if you want to exchange it for all n, it's probably either it's a complete graph or the empty graph. Peter, is there something else? Sounds about right. So, but Christian, on, on this point, what if we do a stochastic black model where the where the blues are are all deterministically linked for sure, and the reds are are not linked? Then it's that's, that's a graph on that's a you know only if you then say that I choose the color of a vertex. If you fix the color of the vertices, you have lost this exchangeability of relabeling vertices, <laughs> and then it's not exchangeable. 
yes, stochastic block model, the way I formulated, is an example of an exchangeable model. So is an exchangeable model, is that um, equivalent to saying any two isomorphic graphs have the same probability? Yes. Not only I no, 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 no. It, it's the same as saying two relabeled graphs have the same properties. They don't need to be isomorphic. Well, I guess it's, those are the same thing, or wouldn't those be the same? Yes, 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 you're, you're right. The same thing. Okay, so. Okay, so what have we seen so far? So this we haven't seen yet, but we have seen that graphons are pretty general model to give large random graphs. Okay. So now we come to different notions of similarity. How I'm doing on time. Um, this clock is not right. Okay. Oh, you also were talking about uh, the like dense graphs. So, so far you haven't said anything about needing graphs to be dense. This is graph um, on model. Okay. So already. it turns out that the way you wrote this thing, if the graph is not dense, then W is identically zero. Okay, so this theoretically fits non-dense graphs, but the non-dense graphs of the theory. Okay, so if you want to do exchangeability for non-dense graphs, you really need different notions, you need different symmetry groups, you can have different notions of exchangeability and you need different theorems to use. And they do exist in some cases, in some other cases, they just say, okay, my underlying graph may be exchangeable, but the graph I see is just a sparse subsample of that, which then will not be exchangeable. Okay, so, let me review, we have these different notions of similarity. So now I should define that for you, okay? So let's start with subgraph counts, okay? So we want to know when two large graphs are similar and we will think of this as looking at your large graph from the left. So I have this huge large graph here in red, okay? And now I map a few number of vertices Oh, I'm, this is not really working. So I take a few vertices, three of them, and I look at some subgraphs, this guy. And now I map these three vertices into my large graph here, here, and here. And then I look whether I see this subgraph as an induced subgraph in the setting I have done it, okay? So, we map K vertices into our large graph. We look what we see, and then we count how often we do see that, okay? So you take some finite graph, you map its vertex set into your large graph. So V1 up to VK are in the large graph. One up to K is the small graph, okay? So this is the image of the first vertex in your small graph. This is the second of the small graph vertices is the last of the small graph vertices mapped into your large graph, okay? You sum over all possible things like that. Then you look that if there's an edge in your little graph, whether you see the edge in the large graph. And if there is no edge in the little graph, then you don't want to see it, right? The JSON matrix is one if there's an edge. So this means you don't see it. This means you see it, okay? So this counts with a little bit of tweaking the number of induced subgraphs. And that could be possibly this is a sum which contains V to the K terms, so I normalize. Now, it's not quite the number of induced subgraphs because I allow some of these vertices to be the same. If N is large, by the birthday paradox, it's very unlikely that if you map K vertices into it randomly, they are the same. So in practice, the difference doesn't really matter. This is just a different definition slightly. And this is just more convenient for me to do my proofs. Okay, you could do the other definition. Everything works. 
just sort of the algebra gets more complicated. Yeah. So if this were the, that's what I'm saying. If you wanted this to be induced subgraphs, I would need them to be still distinct, but I don't ask them to be distinct. So if V i and V j is the same, okay, then actually um, we better make sure that we don't map an edge to, so, so then it's sort of, right? So you, so for example, if I map this, if I map this two vertices to the same, since my graph has no loops, this will not contribute here. But maybe I actually map these two. So this is my small graph and I map these two the same. Well, this has no loop and there's no edge here. So this is not the same as restricting this to distinct. But if they're not distinct, you sort of don't count these things if you would map into a loop because my graph G has no loops. Okay. So, um, and furthermore, as n goes to infinity, we are really interested in large graphs. It doesn't really matter whether they're distinct or not. Okay. So now we call a sequence of graph subgraph convergent. Yes. But you don't. You're not asking H to be a connected graph, right? So it. I don't ask it to be a connected. So that means that you you could map two edges to the same edge in the target graph. And that would that would count. Do you want that? Or so I could map. So what you say? I could do this. This. That I could map this to this. And by the way, I could find that it would count. Um, in practice, it so it would count. Yeah. Again, it doesn't really matter for large n. Okay. And it's convenient because this form actually is well anyhow. It just turns out to be convenient, then it becomes sort of easier to formulate cards and things like that. Okay. Um, all these differences really in practice, if I am interested in the limit n goes to infinity, you just get extra extra errors, which are of order k squared over n, which sort of don't matter because all my errors will be much larger. So anyhow, so, but morally it's very simple. You have this large graph, you look how many triangles are in there, how many open triangles are in there and so on. And the sequence is considered subgraph convergence if normalized by V to the K. So for triangles, this is three and so on. So normalized by what would we would see in a complete graph. Uh, this guy converges. So we call these this frequency of H in G as an induced subgraph and actually sort of almost because of what we're discussing. Okay. So that's one, one notion. Okay. Now the notion of thinking of this as a random thing is you have a large graph G. And now you choose x1 up to xk with replacement at random in your large <coughs> vertex set V. And then you look on the induced subgraph, which you see there, or to be more precise, again, I define it like that. Okay, so if if i and g, if x, i and x, j happen to be the same. Well, I will only put an edge. So I will not put an edge there because that would be a loop and my graph doesn't have loops, okay? So um, it's still a reasonable definition. You could again define this by saying, I will look at the properly induced subgraphs and you would choose here injective maps, okay? And you would define sample K like that, okay? This one has the advantage that if I sample in a that I if I sample from a vertex set, if I sample the first five vertices and the next five vertices, it really becomes independent. Okay. If you ask them to be distinct, then obvious doesn't become independent anymore because once you have chosen your first five one, 
the next one have to be different from that. And that is just convenient to have this kind of independence in my samples for the mass. So, okay, so we call it sampling convergence if the distribution of these guys converge. Now, why is this clearly equivalent to subgraph counts? Well, what is the probability of seeing a particular graph? Well, this is equal to the number of possible samples, which is k to the n in the denominator and upset is how often this graph appears. So this is actually just in disguise, the same thing we had before. Okay, so the two of them are clearly the same. And so we call these notions left convergence because you think of it as having a large graph here. I take a small graph and map it into the large graph and see whether you see that image or not. So now let's come to computer science. Okay, so what's a cut? Well, you take two subsets S and T in your vertex set and you look at the number of edges which go from S to T. You may want to think of T as a complement from S. You may think of T as the same as S and it counts the number of edges inside the graph S. Um, in general, you just have S and T and look at the number of edges and you divide by N squared, okay? Now, a lot of things in computer science can be just calculated from that. For example, max cut in a graph is just the maximum over all S, the number of edges between S and S complement. Min bisection, you take the minimum, but it's a bisection, so you ask S to have size half. And if N is odd, you do here minus one. Um, okay, so, or you could sort of put here one third, there's sort of generalizations, right? So now, can we generalize that for more than two groups? Is there some multi-way cuts? And let me walk you through that slowly, okay? So now I want to look at K cuts, so that's why there's K. So now I choose actually a map from your large vertex set into a small set. So now this will be a notion of testing the large graph from the right. So this is the same as just coloring your large graph. Don't worry whether it's a proper coloring or not, you just color it in some way, okay? Which is the same as looking over all possible partitions into K sets. And now you define a weighted, so now you say how many edges are there from red to green, you multiply it by some constant J red green. You want to know how many arches are there from green to blue, you multiply it by a different constant and so on, right? So this really sort of counts in a weighted way the number of cuts between all different pairs of different colors, given the partition, or if you want, given the coloring. Okay, and now the generalization from min by section is, I will fix the size of these classes. Okay, since I again have to worry what odd or even I put smaller equal one, but think of it as really fixing the size of the color classes. And then you just take the minimum of all possible cutting into different groups of these colors, which have the prescribed size. And then you ask what minimizes this constant here, okay? So min bisection would just be that alpha is one half for the two and J is just one. And if you want max bisection, you make, um, you do just, you make J negative. And so you can map essentially all these global properties you might be interested in in computer science into this, okay? So this is the generalization of cuts. And now we call a sequence convergent if all these multi-way cuts converge, okay? So this would be my notion of cut convergence. Now, if you talk to statistical physicists, they will watch you in amazement and say, what you're doing, this is not cuts, this is just 
This is the energy of a spin model. You even call it J, we also call it J. This is called the interaction matrix. It tells you if your spin is, has a certain color and the neighbors has another color, what the energy of cost of the two of them is. You sum over those. This is just the energy of your, what we call spin configuration, and you called colorings. And this guy, we also have a name for, it's called the microcanonical ground state energy. Ground set energy because you take a minimum of the energy and microcanonical because you fix how many in each class you have. And once they realize, they say, but you know, entropy is important in life and you shouldn't just define this, you should look at the free energy. Okay, so now I have to walk you. So who has seen free energies? Not that many, okay. So the physicists try to model these configurations of spins, okay? And they want some statistics on the spins. Think of the spins at little magnets, which can point up or down, or maybe you're in some crystal where they can point up, down, right, or left, or maybe think of them as whether at this certain point in your crystal, you're in this configuration or in this configuration, or take a simple model of a gas, whether this site is full or empty, so that's what the physicist thinks of this sigma x, okay? And then they say, well, this configuration of spins, this is the physics world, so it had some energy, okay? And now things which have very high energy should be unlikely. It's very hard to get something to high energy. And they weigh a configuration by what's called the Gibbs factor by the energy e to the minus energy. And since I divided the energy in such a way that it was of order unity, physicists will actually multiply it back by n for a reason we'll get to in a moment. And then they want to calculate probability distribution with respect to this guy. And if you calculate probability distribution with respect to this guy, then you have to normalize by this guy, which is called the partition function. Okay. Now I can comment on why I put the n here. This we normalize so it's of order one. Here there are Q to K to the V, so K to the N many configuration. So this is exponential in N. And if you want sort of balance out the different configurations, right? So you could make this, if this scales much faster, then you just would choose the minimum energy. And if it is run much slower, then you would just could as well leave out this factor. So this is the only reasonable normalization where you actually get to balance what physicists call entropy, the number of possibilities here and energy. Okay. Question, you also in the previous slide, you had this alpha from delta K. Is this compact? Uh, in the previous slide, you had this alpha, yes, alpha. alpha is a fraction of the things that should be in one color class. I see mm -hmm. that. But in the previous slide, you had this choice of alpha coming from uh, big delta, it's so okay in the previous slide. Oh, I have that here too. The sum of the alphas has to be one. Okay, that's Because the, if you look at the sum of the, the sizes of all color classes, has to be n, right? That's the number of words. So, so in other words, if I fix a certain color class to be n times alpha i, you better make sure that the sum of alpha i is equal to one, because otherwise, this just giving the pro proportion of the vertices in one color class, right? Yes. So alpha i is the proportion of vertices in color in color class i. And that's why it's called microcanonical. Okay. So physicists will also look at this quantity where they don't have the alpha, and then it's called the canonical partition function. Um, and it's different physics ensembles. They sort of describe different properties of the world. One is called free energy, one is called free entropy. There's sort of all kinds of ensembles in physics. But we are looking at this particular version. Okay, because it's sort of the generalization of these cuts where I wanted to, in particular, do min by section for which I had to fix the size of the classes. And it's also something in the real world, right? If I, yes, I might model sort of having so many atoms of oxygen and so many atoms of hydrogen in this room, 
and I might put some probability distribution, but in practice, if this room is closed, okay, that's just a certain number of one kind and a certain number of the other kind. So in many sort of when you try to do your isolated physics experiment in little bottle, that in this bottle you have a fixed number of the different particles, and that's where this comes from. Okay. And so this is sort of what the physicists are interested in that quantity because it sort of mixes between entropy, how many coloring you had if you don't even count whether they're proper colorings or not, and energy, which sort of punishes certain configurations and makes others more likely. And so we just say, okay, if these converge, then we call this thing uh, convergent again, okay? So I gave you all these different notions and it turns out that they're all equivalent, okay? So this is actually the main result of this theory of graph convergence. It takes roughly a hundred pages to prove sort of, and there is a notion of a cut matrix I will define in a moment the first 50 pages proves that the cut metric is equivalent to this one. And the second paper proves that it's also equivalent to these two. And it's sort of complicated in the details, okay? But in, from very far away, it's actually not that difficult. So let's, for example, look at this multi-way cuts, okay? They're defined in terms of how many edges go from red to green, well, if, but I haven't defined the cut metric, okay. So the cut metric will be defined in such a way that naturally if two graphs are near in the cut metric, the cuts will be similar, okay. That's why it's named that, okay. And some of the others are more complicated and I will prove some of them and I will not prove the others too. So, so now I have to define for you what the cut metric is so you understand this here. So before the cut metric, what you have is just they're all equivalent, okay? So if all of these converge for all finite subgraphs, this is the same as the sampling converge that we already discussed. It's the same as if for all Ks, a weighted multi-way cuts converge. It's the same as if for all K, the microcanonical free energies converge. So, um, so what is the cut metric I mentioned in this here, okay? So now we want to look again, when do we want to compare? We want to compare two large graphs, okay? And we want to say when they are similar. And we don't want all these, these constraints from the people who tell us what they want about the graph. We really want some more intuitive thing, some distance between graphs, right? So for example, you might just say, right, take the two adjacency matrix, subtract them from each other, take some norm, and that's the metric. Okay, and it will actually not be that far from what we're going to do, okay? So you want something that sort of much more hands-on than this infinite sequence of things you have to look at, okay? So now we want to compare graphs on different number of nodes. So I can't really subtract the two adjacency methods, okay? That's an issue. So what do I do for that? Well, let me just first do it in pictures. We have some graph here. I call that the PhD student graph. This is sort of my PhD students, and this is their thesis, okay? And the first PhD student really only has to read his own, he has the first PhD, he only has to read his own thesis, okay? Now comes this poor second guy, I said, you know what, you should read so-and-so's PhD thesis because we're going to build on it, and obviously you have to read your own. And the third student has to read three theses, and the last student, unfortunately, has to read all these other PhD theses, okay? It's called the half graph. And now what do I do? I take the number of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 14 points, and I take my unit interval and divide it into little intervals of width one over 14. And now I put a black square if there's an edge, and the white square if there's no edge, okay? And if instead having this sort of seven by seven, it would be 14 by 14, you would just get smaller squares. But if you squint your eyes, they will, I mean, the steps will look slightly different, but the two of them will look pretty similar, 
Okay, so this seems to be some way of saying I compare graphs on different nodes of vertices if these pictures look similar. Okay, so formally I take n, I replace it by a, a union of disjoint intervals of length one over n, these little things. I look at the squares which is sort of one of the interval times one of the other intervals. This is one of the square one times nine. And then I set this function equal to one if this guy had a one in the adjacency matrix and to zero otherwise. Okay, so this is just a pictorial representation of the adjacency matrix in a way that I can compare graphs on different number of nodes. In this case, it's a diagonal going from our left to our right. Diagonal is going here. Okay, so this is a function. So this is sort of funny, right? For matrices, we draw them like that. But for function, we have X and Y and we draw them like that. So I have no idea why we decided to draw matrices sort of right and down and functions up and right. So it's a different convention. So black is one. Black is one and white is zero. Okay. And now, so how would we compare them? Well, we do what's called the cut metric. Okay. So what is this? So we could just do, we could just take this function, take the absolute value, integrate from zero, integrate over the whole square. That would be one way. But it turns out that this will be a too fine way. We will ask sort of, there will be graphs which are similar in many purposes, which we will then call far away because this one norm is actually not the right norm. So what you do instead is the following. You look at subsets S and T of the unit interval. So imagine that this W is again your checkerboard, right? So if the W is a checkerboard, then your little square on the little square either have a one or a zero. Okay. So, and maybe now this W was a difference of two of these guys, but still, either on this square, this thing is negative or it's positive. Okay. And if it's positive, and this maximum will either be obtained with this being equal to this or equal to minus this. Let's say it's obtained for so this being equal to plus this. If it's obtained for this equal to plus that, then on this little square, if there's a one, I might as well include the whole one, whole square, because that only makes this bigger. And if it's equal to zero, I can as well leave out the whole square, because otherwise I can make it smaller. Or put differently, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so if this W was actually one of these step functions, then this S and T would actually correspond to original subset of your graphs and the union of the corresponding intervals. So then this would look like that, okay? This would be S and here T is S complement. And this would count the number of edges between here and here. And since this W, the width of the interval, their squares are five minutes, are one over N squared. This would be normalized, okay? Um, so we define it like that. And then, um, you have so so that's some distance. Okay, you can you can convince yourself that if you have two graphs, it will be only zero if the graphs are exactly the same. The non isomorphic graphs are not zero. So the problem is that you will have non isomorphic graphs. So you could have isomorphic graphs where the distance is non zero. Okay. Right, that's an issue. That's a problem. So what do we do? So we want to just take the minimum over relabelings. So what's the relabeling of a continuous interval? It's so-called measure preserving transformation. What's a measure preserving transformation? It's a transformation which if you start with a random variable, this is uniform, the image is again uniform, okay? So which is the analog of permutations. If I have a uniform point in a finite set and I do a permutation, then again, I'm uniform, okay? So the measure preserving transformations is exactly the analog of relabelings. And so we take the infimum over relabelings 
And so in particular, if your underlying Ws were actually representations of step functions for graphs, then these relabelings shuffling around sort of little intervals don't change the distribution. It's still the uniform distribution. And this, so this infant contains in particular relabeling. So if two graphs are isomorphic, this distance will be zero. And um, so now we just define this distance like that. Okay? And if you write it out, you take the infant of measure preserving transformation, you take the maximums over sets S and T, and you, calc you compare the cut in one graph to the cut in the other, where the cut is defined with this continuous function so that you compare graphs on different vertices. So if you didn't put this integral here and put the absolute value inside, which obviously is a bound, that would be the L1. But we don't do that, we do this because it's very natural because it compares, it says sort of that these two graphs are similar if embedded into this set of functions because they have similar cuts. Yes. So WG1, you are missing this phi, right? WG1, because we are taking the interval over labeling of phi. Yes. W oh, I'm missing the phi. Right? Yeah. Well, don't, don't do it. it. Don't do it. <laughs> Should be a phi here. Something will kill me. <laughs> Should phi be it's... over G1 or over W? <laughs> The phi is so you have a step function wg1, and then you apply the measure transformation that you, which I wrote up here, or you could write here. I can yes, okay. Phi, is phi of x and phi of y. y. Okay, so you compare the step function of this and the step function of this, where here you have to apply the length of the vertices. And I think I'm running out of time. Let's see, this is a, it's a nice. Okay, so let me just talk about that from the distance and next time we will do details. So how will we now prove the theorem? So we prove, so assume that this cut distance is some epsilon, okay? Well, let's sort of start with this multi-way cuts. The so multi-way cuts are just essentially K squared possible cuts. So you will believe me that if this distance is epsilon, then maybe these cuts can't be much far away then k squared times epsilon. It's not quite true. You need some rounding errors and you have to do integer rounding and stuff to make that precise, but roughly it's true, okay? And these, well, this actually holds for the cuts before you take any minimum. So whether you put it in exponent and sum over something. So these two sort of, it's sort of clear that there will be sort of some k squared times epsilon, something like that. What about these guys? Well. That we will, I will show to you. Okay, it's not that easy, but it actually turns out to be true as well. Okay, so here you again have a constant which depends on k, but otherwise, if the cuts are this, if there is the two graphs are way epsilon in this, then actually this finite graph subgrounds are way epsilon times it turns out k squared. Okay, so this is one direction which is easy, and the other is much more complicated. And I will give you the proof for both direction in this example in some detail next time. And then we'll discuss how to, dis how to construct limits and what is sort of to be proven. Thank you. We got a lot of questions in the talk. Maybe we will break here and then if you have questions, ask them. Thank you.